Hi, this is Dr. Mark Pitstick. You're listening to Ask the Soul Doctors. I have the great news for you that no matter what your questions or quandaries in life, the soul doctor's diagnosis is always the same. You are perfect. You are one with the one and an integral part of source energy. As such, you have everything you need to handle all of life's changes and challenges with style. The more you realize this, the more you see that this earth experience is a totally safe and magnificent adventure amidst eternity. I'm excited today to have with us a giant in the field of consciousness studies, Raymond Moody, Jr., MD, Ph.D., now I'm going to call him Dr. Moody. His website, lifeafterlife.com and raymondmoody.org. Dr. Moody is a psychiatrist, the author of the pioneering book on near-death experiences, Life After Life, and others, Life After Loss, Reunions, Glimpses of Eternity. I think I've read them all. They're all wonderful. He most recently came out with a great two-hour video uh, called Conversations with Eben Alexander and Raymond Moody. So you'll want to read his books. you want to watch his video. He has training off his website, again, lifeafterlife.com. So let's uh, dive right in. We have an opportunity to ask a very wise man. I should say that we spent a week together, oh, 15 years ago probably, training in Nevada with his psychomentium training. And Dr. Moody is one of the most impressive combinations of intellect and heart that I've ever met in my life. So I'm uh, honored, deeply honored to have him here and excited to hear his answers to those greatest questions that people have. So, Dr. Moody, if you're ready, let's dive in. The Wonderful. It's so great to be with you again, too, Mark. Thank, thank you. Thank you. The first question that people so often ask is, who am I? Oh, my word. Oh, wow, wow, wow. You know, tomorrow, Mark, I'm getting ready to... Go away with a few uh, for a few days with an old friend of mine I've known since uh, 1976, who's a uh, clinical psychologist, but with a spiritual orientation. And mm -hmm. you may know that the first person I ever heard uh, report a near-death experience was Dr. George Ritchie in 1965. Right. And um, I have known the friend that I'm going. Uh, with tomorrow um, through that context since 1976 and tomorrow we're getting ready to go uh, away uh, our wives and, uh, and us to a retreat in North Carolina where the that is the very question that is asked, Mark. You know, who am I? And so by the wildest um coincidence, I am prepared to sort of redress that question. And, um, you know, um, just to get right to it, I mean, you know, the greatest people, thinkers there have ever been have, have struggled with this one. Um, you know, what is it that, that that essence, that centerpiece or that center of yourself that makes you that unique, irreducible individual person you are and um and and if you think about it especially i, I was uh, kind of a philosophically uh, attuned kid i guess and i remember having this conversation with myself oh gosh one of the first things i woke up to just as a very early child is that uh this consciousness thing is pretty weird i mean how can this be there's i, I guess uh, my, my first foray really was astronomy at the age of seven. That's been a passion all my life. And that really wakes you up to this because you see this vastness out there. And that uh, that sort of focuses your, your attention then on that, that I am conscious now, which is an amazing thing. Sure. And always from the very beginning, I have suspected that. It's the consciousness that's in charge because I can, I'm directly aware of that, of that I'm sure. Everything else is kind of an inference, right? It's like from patterns in their consciousness. But where I am with it now is probably quite startling. I think that the self is a narrative self, Mark. What, because, you know, do you know Elie Bazell, the story of him? No. 
he was a man who survived Auschwitz and was a wonderful, wonderful um, man who, after the war, became a sort of uh, Nazi hunter and trying to track down the ones that escaped and so on. And he said, um, and his great wisdom, because he was a very wise man, and he, he said, God made man because he, capital H-E, loves stories. And, you know, if you think about it, what is a human life but a story? I, I um, used to do, before I did forensic psychiatry, I was very interested in geriatric psychiatry. And not just with, I had lots of elderly demented and so on, but, but uh, also lots of older people who were just depressed or, you know, good cognitive shape, but were having um, situational stress or, you know, some grief or whatever. And um, so uh, very articulate people. And I began to hear something which anybody will tell you if you just listen to elderly people. They'll say that at some point you develop this thing in your life where you look back and you get this uncanny impression that it has been a sort of script or like a play. And um, and I heard uh, Joseph Campbell, the mythologist, say that too. And now I'm beginning to sense it myself at age 69. And this is... Um, this is, I think, corresponds to a reality, a very deep reality. Um, I think that, you know, what is it about a human being uh, that makes us unique from any other species? Have they tried tools? That doesn't work. Even ravens make them. Um, and uh, the language thing is iffy, you know, maybe dolphins or whatever. But one thing that as far as we know, no other known species do is we tell stories. And as we go along in our life, we weave a life story. We tell our life story as it, as it goes along. And so um, that's where I am with it. I, Plato looked at this and said that there's this immaterial entity that kind of inhabits the philosophy physical substance of the body and he called it the soul and 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 of course you know that's a word that's very important to all of us and at the same time the idea that it's I mean it's just very difficult to put into words exactly what that is it's uh, there've been fights about it all through the centuries from the Middle Ages. Then in, in uh, the 17th century, John Locke, in the wake of all that sort of, um, you know, um, collapse of the authority of the church, to, which was based on Aristotle, to, to um, you know, to enforce on people, uh, John Locke uh, began thinking about it, and he said that what he thought that constituted the self-identity or the personal identity was your memories, right? That it was a stream of memories. But then Hume came along and said, well, actually, that as he looks inside of himself, he He's never able to see anything except specific little ideas or sensations or perceptions. And he can never identify anything in his introspective process that would correspond to some sort of stable substrate there. In other words, that it's always just flowing. And um, so, you know, that's the status of the philosophical debate. But uh, as for me, I'm, I've come around to this uh, this narrative kind of concept of it. I like it. And so from that model, Dr. Moody, what about the second question, why am I here then? Why am I here? Well, I can take my thoughts about that from um, <clears throat> listening to thousands of people with near-death experiences who go through these, uh, you know, they almost die and they have the out of the body and into the flight and they see their life in this vivid panorama. They see everything you've ever done. It's right there in front of you instantaneously. Now, people say that when they tell us about this subsequently, 
they have to relate it to us as though it were a sequence because language is sequential. But they say in the experiencing of it, it's not sequential, that everything is there all at once. And very often they, they say that they experience this in the company of a being, of an illuminated being, like a being of light, of complete compassion that's there to, you know, to sort of help them review it or, you know, and, and um, they say that, that in this situation, what you see is it just stands out, both because of this compassionate, loving being you're with, but also and just in the nature of the case, that what this is all about is love and learning to love. Because, they say, in this panorama you see each action of your life, but when you do, it's like you're looking at another person. Right? You're, you're seeing yourself doing the action. <clears throat> and you are embedded in the consciousness of the person with whom you've interacted. Hence, if you see yourself doing something mean-spirited to that other person, then you are immediately, you're feeling the sad feelings and hurt. Or if you see yourself doing something loving, then you, you get the good feelings back. So everybody comes back from this saying that, you know, that it's love. You know, that this is what we're here to sort of learn and to, you know, to get experience with and everything. And also, it's um, where I have reached with this, Mark, and I know that, you know, people in your profession and my profession might judge me as psychotic on what I'm about to say, <laughs> but I have just sort of, I think that what, that the closest you can come to a description of what this thing what we're, we're in is, um, is God's educational and entertainment medium. Mm, I like it. There are, you know, several billions of these little, um, narrative threads, right, going in, weaving in and out, and, and everybody's sort of little story going, you know, intersecting with somebody else's for some period of time and then diverging or whatever, and holy mackerel, and like Ellen Giselle said, God loves stories. Well, imagine the thrill he's getting out of this, and the idea, for example, you know, I, as you remember, probably, I, I'm a lover of astronomy and since age seven, and I keep up with it, and recently I read the most accurate count ever made of the number of stars. This is, a, of course, you know, the most accurate they can come to a statement of the number of stars in the known universe is 150 billion trillion. Now, let's say that the average star has only four planets around it, that the sun is way out on the right-hand side of the curve because it's got more than most, but let's say the average number is four. That's 600 billion trillion planets in the known universe, and they're beginning to hone in on the idea that it's about one out of 1,000 planets are Earth-like. So you think, and already they've detected some, see, like Earth-like ones in the right zone, and and so the, you know, and to me it's just amazing, Mark. I think you got to admit that this is an accomplishment, <laughs> that God, watching all those different things going on on all those worlds, is is concerned as Pat Robertson and company think that he is about two gay guys living together. So I mean, you see what I'm talking about? It's to me, it is just we live in an amazing yeah. universe, and that why are we here? I think part of it is the thrill of the stories. And this is, I mean, you know, this is just an, an amazing existence we live. Last time I talked to you, I was like, I, you know, as you know, I've just never, the idea of an afterlife has never set well with me in the sense that it seems counterintuitive. But recently I've sort of woken up that I've run out of options in terms of that one. And so, 
in a distance, I think there is. Oddly enough to me, it's still amazing to me. In addition to this vast one that we're in with all these complications, there's there's another one. You know that that this one is encompassed in some vaster thing. That's and with all of its immense. Well, um, that if that's not far out enough for the listeners, I don't think anything will be. Dr. Moody, I'm <laughs> thinking back 15 years ago, we were having dinner in this Swiss chalet in the mountains outside uh, Las Vegas, and I asked you, in your opinion, is there any doubt that there's an afterlife? And you uh-huh. said, as a scientist, I can't say irrevocably there is an afterlife, but personally, based on all the evidence I've seen, I believe there is. So uh, at that point, Mark, what I was thinking was in terms of the idea, which I maintained for a long time, that this thing that people have, which they've always called a near death, you know, which we call now a near death experience, is which people have had since antiquity. You know, Plato wrote about them and Democritus. And what I was getting at is that I think that that experience is what people have always called the afterlife. You see what I mean? In other words, that that the whole idea of life after death is that's where it came from, that people have always known that people who come close, you know, and come back have this thing. And, but in terms of any sort of self-assurity of a personal survival, I had, was still having trouble with this one, but I've had something just in the past couple of years come up, Mark, that is really just, uh, I mean, I just, I can't come up with any alternate frame of, reference to account for this except to I think the simplest thing for me to say is I think there's an afterlife great I appreciate it we're uh, next I'd like to ask you about this this light this presence that near-death experiencers describe and you've worked with so many people who had empathetic near-death experiences yes. near-death experiences what what is your current understanding of what what it God is like, this light, this presence? God, somebody asked me, Mark, they say, Raymond, do you believe that God exists? I tell them quite honestly and openly, no, absolutely not. Because I say this, I say, number one, I, Raymond Moody, I know myself to be such a limited human being that any belief that I could formulate about God would be off base and distorted, you know, badly in one direction or another. And secondly, if you think about it, that sentence, Raymond, do you believe that God exists? What the emphasis of that sentence is on the word exist. I say to you, Mark, that God is bigger than the concept of existence. You see what I mean? As a logician, I can symbolize the concept of existence. That is a human notion, a concept. But God is bigger than the, these. That God, you can't put God in that limited human kind. God is, the reality of God is far greater than, you know, concepts like existence. Existence. It's some some philosophers of language have actually suggested that this I, this word exist is just a figure of speech anyway, and that you know in logic you can symbolize it in a certain way. And what I'm saying is, really, you know, we put a lot of emphasis on it, but really it's just a concept we use in our language. And to me, God is bigger than you know, far vaster than any sort of human concept. So. I would think that from the point of view of God, that existence would be a kind of constraint or something, if you see what I mean, by, of a reality so vast might want. To, and so, uh, but to me, God is relationships. God is is a personal relationship you have, and also it is God 
manifest in your inter in our interpersonal our, our relationships with other people too. I think. Yeah, yeah, and um, and again, I say it's like I was saying, God is watching everybody through everybody's eyes. In my opinion. And um, and and that it, it goes far beyond that because you know it's to me God is so vast is I can hardly you know I think it would be rather arrogant of me for example to 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 exclude God from the cosmos and in the in the sense that um, you know God is watching over not just this human existence but over this whole picture so you know that we're getting you know this is this is is really vast and so um i think that relationship is what is the crux of it to me i um i can say i have a personal relationship with god and I think as you grow older, maybe, or I think that one thing I've realized that relationships with God are a lifelong development. You know about developmental psychology. Well, I think that as a human being ages, we go through these different life phases. Well, you know, relationship with God sort of goes along in that that. Um, order too and changes or you know matures or develops and um so um i think that to me prayer kind of keeps me going and i don't mean by the way give me a color tv i mean this is and i don't mean save the world i i i mean um just very minimal because um it's basically I pray for protection for my children and me on their behalf mm -hmm. because they're you know they're still young and uh, I figure things beyond that are not my business. See, it's like to say, oh please let the GE not go under you know on the stock market or whatever. That's none of my business. It's like God, you know, the bigger plan, the God's. Plot is much better, I think, in this drama that we're in than than any other um, solution I could come up with. So, when mostly I see, I just sort of surrender is the most powerful prayer, just to, uh, to let it be worked out um, by that that sort of thing, because that's that always ends up being the cleverest and best solution. <laughs> Oh, what a what a mind, Doctor Moody. Let me ask you this: How, What can you say to people who were brought up with a certain religion, and that religion teaches some things uh, that are, let's say, limited thinking? Uh, that there is a fiery eternal hell. That there is only uh -huh. one way to salvation. Only yeah. one true religion. Things like being. Yes, is, I know. Yes. What a scary thing. Well, what an interesting topic here. Number one, if I, if this book I'm writing is a book of, it's called God is Bigger Than the Bible, and it's about twelve ideas I have about God, and and one of them is this. Listen, it's God doesn't care whether we join a religion. You know, it's fascinating to me that many, apparently billions of people think that God is encouraging them to, or requiring them to join some particular religion. And it's it's fascinating to me because, number one, they can't quite get it in agreement that he seems to be, you know, requiring some to, you know, different people to join different ones, which is odd. But me, I didn't grow up religious. My, my, it's, I just, you know, my mother, my grandmother, my mother's mother was kind of humorous about religion and poked humorous fun very gently at it. And my dad was very cynical about it, having been, number one, a surgeon, uh, and everybody probably knows that personality. Number two, a professional military officer. Okay, so there's another um, personality. And then, in that context, see, a, 
in the Pacific Theater as a medic in World War II. And, he, you know, that generation didn't talk, but I sort of gather that, as I put it together, that, you know, he was just there because of what he saw, which must have been horror after horror, sure. that he, um, you know, his religion was nowhere with him. And that's how I grew up with that attitude. To me, it was... <laughs> Sorry, but I just sort of thought it was laughable. I mean, I'm sorry to be so blunt, but I'm 69 years old, and I made a lot of fun of, of religion when I was a child, <laughs> or as a not a child but an adolescent. I made parodies and so on. But um, God has never said a word to me about religion, you know. And I, you know, I think that I consult Him about life, just several times a day and I you know I know from his ways that he would be giving me some sort of direction on this he gives me direction on a lot of stuff mm -hmm. but he, he doesn't communicate about religion and I think to him it must be a, a, an item of some hilarity <laughs> because you know it's just so funny the whole picture so God doesn't require us or or he's I don't think he cares whether he we you know join a religion I really don't good okay I like that and, and so when you say you check in with God a couple times a day I'm interested what ways have you found to best hear the voice of your inner self or, or of God well it's just a long process it's just one thing it's just a matter of sort of sitting and doing it and then when you do it it sort of starts having results I, back in uh, I moved back into the house that I am living in now which is an old grist mill and in May of 1990 and it's a grist mill that was built in 1839 and it had last been rewired when I moved in in 1990 in 1950 and so I knew it needed rewiring, but I didn't have the money at that time. And three years and, let's see, June, July, August, four months later, three years and four months later, my wife one day said, well, you know, we can get the money together now to get the rewiring, but we didn't know an electrician, so we held hands by our kitchen sink and prayed that God would send us just the right electrician. I know that seems a rather mundane concern, but this is kind of how it works, I gather, is that you, it's, it's, it's maybe it's like a cosmic Bitcoin or something, I guess. It's like the point of the prayer was that maybe there's a need out there, you know, that send us just the right electrician. You don't, you can plunge into the yellow pages or you can reflect a moment and send it up to God. And so, mm -hmm. and I swear all this is true because any, when you have this kind of experience, it would be just a very an abhorrent to in any way exaggerate it. The amazing, what, what's the, the, it's the, the reality of it that's amazing. And so what happened was that the next morning the phone rang, and Cheryl, my wife, picked it up and said hello, and a voice on the other end said, hello, this is B.R. Wilson. And Cheryl said, uh, yes, B.R., what is it? And he said, well, your number just came up on my beeper. I swear I'm telling you the truth. And Cheryl said, well, we haven't made any phone calls this morning, B.R., what's this all about? And he said, I'm, well, I'm an electrician. So she, so she said, come on over, B.R. He did. He looked around. He gave his estimate. He was walking out. You know, it's not his estimate. He just looked at his inspection, walked out. Cheryl took him to the van. Just a couple of minutes later, they were back up on the porch. She, and, or less than a minute, really. And, and she, just as she was putting him into his van, he said, well, it'll be a few days before I can get out here. It's like my brother died and my, my mother died and had a heart attack on the way home from the funeral home. So my wife said, well, maybe my husband can help you with that, B.R. He talks to people who've been through things like that. And B.R. said, well, 
my mother gave me this book called Life After Life to Read, and it's helping some. So, you know, I, but I, you know, I'm sure many other people have had such experiences, and um, um, so that's where I am with God. I I think that God is uh, God interacts with us constantly yeah this is uh, and incidentally atheism atheism is you know if you really think about it and i'm talking here about what i would call rhetorical atheists or uh, you know or people who make a lot of noise about it i mean you know, and I don't mean just mean somebody who doesn't believe in God or doesn't you know, accept there's a God or something, but I mean the people who are positively, um, um, you know, forward with it and, you know, very vocal about it. Well, it looks to me that that is a relationship with God. You see what I mean? It's like, really, it's, um, it's, but for, it's some way to those people this idea of God is very deeply in them, you see, and that they are fighting against it. It's what it is, it, it's kind of an adolescent behavior, and I'm certainly not making any sweeping generalizations, but many atheists, these, these professional atheists or, you know, uh, vocal atheists about it, are really just seem to me very adolescent. And their mentality, it's a kind of na 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 attitude, or I don't know, just kind of an adolescent rebelliousness almost. Well, and others, I found that they're rejecting the traditional images of God, like the big guy in the sky, when you start talking about the light, the presence, a force, like in Star Wars, uh, they may be able to relate to that. Well, let's, let's get on to a tough one here, and that is uh, the death of a child, one of the toughest tragedies that a person can encounter on Earth. With all of your knowledge, with all of your experience, what, can you, what do you say to people who the child has passed on? You know, I can say that I wish I had more I could say, or even more than that, I wish there was some way I could help. I had that happen to me. My first child died in 1970 at the age of 36 hours. And, you know, I still, that is something that, you know, is a terrible thing to this day. And I know that feeling. And what I have come to think about it is that it's always going to be there, that loss, and that nothing could justify it. In other words, that there's not any sort of justification that I could ever get of it, but that in terms of its effects, what it has enable me to do is to help people who have been through a loss of a child because that's I do that in my counseling with people and so on and you know it just comes with the understanding I think with among both of us that you know it's not ever going to get reconciled it's um and and yet your consciousness sort of grows up around it. It's always the same grief. If you regard it, if you regard your whole self as a kind of circle there, um, like about the size of a quarter or something, and then you say that when you that whole entire self and your consciousness is almost like filled up with this so dark, you know. And that what I find, if I look at that diagram now, 40-something years hence, 43 years hence, it is still that. It's still that, you know, that just vacancy or that horror, that grief. And, and the difference now is that I am a circle about as big as a grapefruit that that circle the earlier circle is inside up you 
see what I mean? It's still the same grief, but and it even is a little bit more because at each stage you think now he would have been in school, now we would have been, you know, high school, now we've been married or whatever, and um, so that it sort of grows. But still, you know, it's like now I'm, you know, my draw a circle the size of a grapefruit, say, and that's my larger consciousness is in that so that, you know, and that's one of the, you know, the ways that I think you you sort of grow, and um, so there's that aspect of it, and then, you know, talking is the best thing, I think, and... Um, just constantly talking. As we both know, Mark, this, this tendency is that women want to talk, but the men want to not not talk, and that's often a difficulty. And the you know, and because men tend to grieve and or not grieve in different ways. Just you know, it's they they're just not supposed to talk about it. I guess if if you're a man. Sure. Uh, it's the way the culture goes. Given what you said, Dr. Moody, and, and referring back to life as a series of narratives, a series of stories, do you feel like even the death of a child is an important story? Or yes. One that contributes to greater love? Yes, absolutely. You know, it's the death of a child is a big part of anybody's story. This is in relationship to the parents, you know, who've lost children. I and how these people come into our lives and we make an untimely exit and so on. I I think that there is a broader perspective in which all these things weave together. You know, um, I have two grown sons and then two young ones, 15 and 13, both adopted at birth. And uh, Carter is Mexican-American by heritage. We adopted him from Texas, and Carol Ann is a Blackfeet Indian. We adopted her from Montana. And, oh, my God, it's just what a wonderful experience. Both of them, as I said, it was at the moment of birth. We had them from the very beginning. And another thing is I should say that my wife and I don't take kids to any religious ceremonies. And my wife, we don't talk about life after death at home. You know, that's my professional life what we talk about is how to, the kids homework you know what's for dinner you know the whole bit and what's on tv tonight and and um so the kids don't get any of this but both of them have related memories of coming into uh and and uh you know specifically choosing to come to us and that has really focused me on this this idea that we do seem to live not just one life I think makes lots of sense to me and especially if you look at the uh, the research by uh, Dr. Ian Stevenson Brian Weiss's work and so on great well we uh, there's a question that's often asked and since you're a pioneer in the after death context especially the facilitated type and that is after death contacts uh, are very common. Over 75 million Americans have had one. But people ask, well, why hasn't my departed loved one contacted me? And what can I do to enhance the chances of that? Mark, the answer as to why some do and some don't is honest to goodness, I don't know. In terms of the methods of enhancing it, there is an ancient modality it was known all over the world of evoking the deceased through gazing into clear depths and this was done in Japan at places where they would have these areas like parks where there were little ponds of water and with uh, arched bridges over them or in Greece where you would go underground and gaze into a a mirror uh, like a mirrored cauldron kind of or, and you can do it with mirrors it was a well-known custom in the united states even until about uh say the 1910 or something like that when it when, it, when radio came in a lot of these victorian things where people would participate in these things sort of 
you know, went away and people began to listen to the radio and then TV. But before that, there was this process of gazing into mirrors to evoke the spirits. It was just very well known. It's, uh, you know, in Through the Looking Glass is a similar thing where people can project their consciousness through the mirror and so on. Yes. And so that's one way. And um, then there's also the ancient method of uh, dream incubation by um, writing a letter to the person who's died and, you know, bring out, uh, spill out your feelings and talk about your feelings and your questions. And then you follow the letter and you put it under your mattress and you just forget about it. And in many cases, that will bring about a... Uh, a sort of nighttime vision, which you know may not be experienced as a dream. It seems more real, or perhaps we might say hypnagogic or something. Where um, so you know there are ways to facilitate this, but I would certainly, from my experience of thinking about this, I I certainly wouldn't experience. I wouldn't interpret any particular significance like that that you don't see a large one means that there's some kind of you know mess there or something I, I don't think of it as that was I just I think we can't understand the the um, you know all the circumstances yet because what we're dealing with here is a sort of other dimension of reality that is kind of arched over this one in a way and it's you know this one is infinite from within but from the from the perspective of without it it's not infinite it's you know it's there's a structure in mathematics as you may know called the Poincaré disk which is the intersection of the Euclidean plane and the hyperbolic plane and which shows that there can be structures which are from within, they're infinite, but from without, they are finite. And I think that we're living in one of those. Well, excellent. Well, we have just a few minutes left, and so I want to uh, tell listeners, Dr. Moody was just talking about his facilitated after-death contact approach, the psychomantium. He describes this in great detail in his wonderful book, Reunions. And uh, so make sure you read that. Again, his website, lifeafterlife.com. Dr. Moody, in the, the few minutes we have left, what would you like to share with others? Well, yeah, I'm going to make a surprising prediction, and that is that I'm just, uh, by the way, you know, logic was my thing, and my Ph.D. in philosophy was on uh, logic and philosophy of language and ancient Greek philosophy, and that that's my field. And I, so i got to say that I'm very conservative in my inferences, but I'm ready to go on and say that uh, we have brand new, completely rational means of investigating the question of life after death, and we are now at a breakthrough, and I am really willing to um, to say a breakthrough in the genuinely rational investigation of life after death, and that... Um, I'm not saying a proof of life after death. I'm saying new ways to give us whole new insights into this. So I think that we're in for a like a, a really sort of wake up with this. And I, I talk more about that too on my website. I mentioned the Raymond Moody dot org has it too about uh, these entirely new ways of looking at things. Great. Well, thank you so much. For what you've done over the years, I'll, I'll just thank you for. The people you've you've helped and reach, and you know we um, we create ripples with our life, and then we have the afterlife reviews, and and get to see and feel all that. And yours is going to be wonderful because you've you've started so many fields of understanding. So, uh, for my listeners, uh, you. if you want to understand more that you really are a soul and how you can live accordingly. Dr. Moody's work is one that you'll want to, to study, to look at. Again, his uh, video with Dr. Eben Alexander, I've uh, not had a chance to watch that yet, but I can't look for I uh, can't wait to uh, to do that. So, again, his website, lifeafterlife.com and raymondmoody.org. Dr. Moody, thank you so much for being with us, and keep up the great work. Thank you so much for having me on your program, Mark.